Part 7 of This is the End by Stella Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. For some minutes, someone had been knocking on the door. The sound was like an intruder in the secret world, beckoning insistently to Jay. But she took no notice of it until a loud voice said, you need not think you are paddling in golden seas and inaccessible to your relations, because you are here, and I can see you through the window. After a moment's confusion, Jay found that this was so, and she got up and let Q in. I will just ask you how you are, he said hurriedly, and how things are going in the other world and all that, but you needn't answer, because I haven't much time, and I want very badly to talk about myself. I never get a chance when Anonyma is there, and when I return to France, which is likely to happen soon, I shan't find much chance to talk there. I am so glad I am going back. I am so sick of hearing other people talk about things that are not worth mentioning. Poor dear Anonyma, she meant all this recent gaiety as a reward to me for war work dutifully done. But if this be jam, give me my next pill unadorned. A motor tour combined with Anonyma is tiring. If I were alone with Russ, I might enjoy it. Who is Russ? The owner of Christina, and Christina is the vehicle which contains us during the search for you. He became aware of the velvet face of Chloris, gazing at him from between his knees. What does Chloris do while you are weekending in heaven? Do you take her with you? There is already a dog there, called Trelawney. By Jove, that would make a nice little clue for Anonyma. There can be only one dog on the seacoast called Trelawney. We could stop and ask every dog we met what its name was. Besides, the name suggests Cornwall. What breed is the dog? Look here, will you write the family a letter, giving it a few neat clues for Anonyma? After all, we ought to give her all the pleasure we can. I sometimes think we are a disappointing family for her to have married. We lie to her, she lies to us. Her enthusiasms make us smile behind our hands. Ours make her yawn behind her notebook. Send us a good, encouraging letter, addressed to the house in Kensington. We always wire our address there as we move. Give us details about Trelawney, and, if possible, the name of the nearest post town. If we must lie, let us give all the pleasure we can by doing so. Poor old Anonyma. It's getting dark. I must go back to the family. I am as a babe in the hands of Anonyma, and like a babe, I promised her I would be back before dark. Do you remember how we used to long to be lost after nightfall, just for the dramatic effect? Yet we were awfully frightened of the dark. Do you remember how we used to dare each other to get out of bed and run three times round the night nursery? I have never felt so brave since, as I used to feel, as I jumped into bed, conscious of an ordeal creditably over. Why is bed such a safe place? I am not half so brave as I used to be. I remember at the age of ten doing a thing that I have never dared to do since. I sat in the bath with my back to the taps. Do you suppose the innocent designer of baths meant everybody to sit like that, with a tap looking over each shoulder? Taps are known to be savage brutes, and it is everybody's instinct to sit the other way round and keep an eye on the danger. If I were as brave now as I was at ten, I could probably win the war. Oh, Jay, I can't stop talking. I am so pleased to be nearly out of the clutches of my relations. Are you sure you won't be killed? asked Jay suddenly. I can't be, said Q. How could I be? I'm me. I'm not brave, and I don't go to France with one eye on duty and the other on the possibility of never coming back. I go because the crowd goes, and the crowd, 
a rather shrunken crowd, will come back safe. I'm too average a man to get killed. Don't you think all those million ghosts are thinking, what business had death to choose me? suggested Jay. No, said Q, I'm sure they know. After a few seconds' pause, he said, By Jove, are you in fancy dress? No, why? Why, indeed? Why a kilt and yards of gaiters? Why a hat like a colonial horse marine? Oh, this is the uniform of a bus conductor, replied Jay. Q scanned it with distaste. Presently, he said, Don't you think you'd better give it up? Buy a new hat with a day's earnings and get the sack. I can't quarrel with my bread and butter, said J. Surely this is only jam, said Q. You've got plenty of money of your own for bread and butter. I haven't now, answered J. I gave up having money when the war started. Perhaps I chucked it into the serpentine. Perhaps not. I forget. Q got up slowly. Well, he said, sure you're all right. I must be going. I don't know when the last train goes. In London, it is impossible to ignore the fact that you are late. The self-righteous hands of clocks point out your guilt whichever way you look. Your eye and your ear are accused on every side. You long for the courteous clocklessness of the country. There, mercifully, the sun neither ticks nor strikes, nor cavils at the minutes. There was a crowd of home-goers at Brownborough Church, and each bus, as it arrived, was like the angel troubling the waters of Bethesda. There was no hope for the old or timid. Hugh was an expert in the small sciences of London. He knew not only how to mount a bus, while others of his like were trying for a breast to do the same, but also how to stand on a space exactly half the size of his boot soles without holding on. This is done, as you probably know too, by not looking out of the window. Q had given up taxis and cigars in wartime. It was his pretense never to do anything on principle, so he would have blushed if anybody had commented on this ingenuous economy. The fact that he had joined the army the first day of the war was also, I think, a tender spot in the conscience of Q. A Victoria Cross would have been practically unbearable, and even to be mentioned in despatches would have been a most upsetting contradiction of that commonplace and unprincipled past of which he boasted. He thought he was such a simple soul that he had no motives or principles in anything that he did. But really he was simpler than that. He was so simple that he did his best without thinking about it. It certainly sounds rather a curious way to live in the twentieth century. Air, you're seven standin' inside, said the gentleman bus conductor, when, after long sojourn in upper regions, he came down to his basement floor. Five standin' is all I'm supposed to have, and five standin' is all I'll allow. Why should I get myself into trouble for havin' more than five standin' if five standin' is all I'm allowed to have? In spite of a chorus of nervous assent from all his flock, and the blushing disappearance of the two superfluous standers, the bus conductor continued his lament in this strain. To the man with a small but loud grievance, sympathy is a fatal offering. The bus conductor had a round red nose and very defective teeth. Q studied him in a new light, for this was Jay's fellow worker. Somehow it seemed very regrettable. I wish I hadn't promised not to tell the family, he thought. He and Jay never broke their promises to each other, and there was a tacit agreement that when they found it necessary to lie to each other, they always gave each other warning. Where the rest of the world was concerned, 
I am afraid they used their discretion in this matter. It ought to be stopped. The tactful foot of family authority ought to step on it. He presented his penny angrily to the bus conductor. I expect this sort of man asks Jay to walk out with him, he thought, and with a cold glance took the ticket offered to him. Lucky I'm so utterly selfish, he thought, or I should be devilish worried. His train was one which boasted a restaurant car, and Q patronized this institution. But when he was in the middle of cold meat, he thought, she is probably trying to live on two pence halfpenny a week, continual tripe and onions. So he refused pudding. The pudding, persistent as only a railway pudding can be, came back incredulously three times, but Q pushed it away. If I could get anybody outside the family to use their influence, I should be within the letter of the law. But I mostly know subalterns, and nobody below a brigadier would be likely to have much influence with Jay. She'd probably talk down even a sergeant major. It seems curious that he should deplore the fact that Jay had turned into a bus conductor more deeply than he had deplored her experiments in sweated employment. I think that a uniformed sister or wife is almost unbearable to most men, except perhaps one in the nurse's uniform, of which even St. Paul might have approved. The gaiters of the bus conductor had shaken Q to his foundations. The thought of the skirt still brought his heart into his mouth. He was so lacking in the modern mind that he still considered himself a gentleman. No socialist, speaking between clenched teeth and a strangled voice of largely groundless protest, had ever gained the ear of Q. He had never joined a society of any sort. He had never attended a public meeting since he gave up being a Salvationist at the age of ten. It must be stopped, he said as he got out of the train. I'll think of a way in my bath tomorrow. This was always the moment he looked forward to for inspirations. Anonyma was observable as he walked from the station to the inn, craning extravagantly from the sitting-room window. She came downstairs and met him at the door. Such a disaster, she said, and handed him a telegram. Hugh stood aghast, as she meant him to. No disaster is ever so great as it is before you know what it is. But Q ought to have known Anonyma's disasters by experience. Russ's wife has appeared. Why should she be introduced as a disaster? asked Q, with a sigh of relief. Is she a maniac, or a suffragette, or a Mormon, or just someone who has never read any of your books? He opened the telegram. It called upon him to rejoin his battalion next day at noon. Russ went to his house to fetch something this morning, and found his wife there. He looks quite ill. She insisted on coming here with him, and now she wishes to go on the tour with us. As I hear the car is hers, we can hardly refuse. I don't pretend to understand the subtleties of this disaster, said Q, but as you evidently don't intend me to, I will not try. Notice, however, that I am keeping my head. I have always wondered how I should behave in a disaster. Wait till you meet her, said Anonyma. Q heard Mrs. Russell's melodramatic laughter as he approached the sitting-room door, and he trembled. She laughed, ha ha ha, in a concise way, and the sound was constant. That is a ready sense of fun that you can hear, said Anonyma bitterly. She is teaching Gustus to see the humorous side. They entered to find poor cousin Gustus bending like a reed before a perfect gale of ha-ha-ha's. Mrs.
Mrs. Russell was so much interested in what she was saying that she left Q on her leeward side for the moment, hardly looking at him as she shook hands. "'It's enough to make the gods laugh on Olympus,' she said, but it did not make Cousin Gustus laugh. Noticing this, Mrs. Russell turned to Q. "'I was telling your cousin about my pacifist efforts in the States,' she said. "'Yes, I can see your eye twinkling. I know, a pacifist is a funny thing to be. But I'm not one of the, what I call, dumpy toad in the hole ones. I do it all joyously. I was telling your cousin how very small was the chance that robbed us of success in Ohio.' "'What sort of success?' asked Q. "'Peace,' said Mrs. Russell. "'But is Ohio at war?' Mrs. Russell laughed heartily. Her unnecessarily frank laughter showed her gums as well as her teeth, and made one wish that her sense of humor were not quite so keen. "'I see you are one of us,' she said, "'what I call one of the jolly fraternity.' No, Ohio is still enjoying peace. But if you follow me, from the States, peace will come. There we must fix our hopes. If we can get those millions of brothers and sisters of ours across the duck pond, as I call it, to see its urgency, peace must come. For brothers and sisters they are, you know. Patriotism will come in time to be considered a vice. How can one's soul if you take my meaning, be affected by the latitude and longitude in which one's body was born. From the States the truth shall come, salvation shall dawn in the West. Listen to me trying to be poetic, it makes me laugh. One noticed that it did. War is so reasonless as to be funny, she said. But you haven't told me yet about the little chance that you thought would tickle Olympus, said Q. You're laughing at me, said Mrs. Russell, but I don't mind, for I laugh at myself. I like you. Shake. Q immediately thought her a nice woman, though peculiar. Mr. Russell looked in and saw the shake in progress. He murmured something and withdrew hurriedly. For a moment they could hear his agitated voice in the passage, reciting Milton to his hound. "'Do listen to my husband, never silent,' said Mrs. Russell. "'Did you ever see a man like him?' There is no real answer to this sort of question, so Q said, "'Yo, which is always safe.' Then he added, do tell me about the little chance. This was the little chance, smiled Mrs. Russell. We ought to have had a tremendously successful peace meeting in a certain town in Ohio. We had every reason to expect three thousand people, and we thought of proposing the renaming of the town, calling it Peace. But the little chance was a printer's error. The advertisement gave the date wrong. A crowd turned up at the empty hall, and two days later, when we arrived, they were so tired of us that they booed our demonstration. Just the stupidity of an inky printer between us and success. "'Do you mean to say that but for that we should have had peace by now?' asked Q in a reverent voice. "'You never know,' said Mrs. Russell. That meeting might have been the match to light the flame of peace all over the world. It's bitterly and satirically funny, isn't it, what fate will do? Ha, ha, ha! Cousin Gustus laughed hysterically in chorus, and then said that his head ached, and that he thought he would go to bed early. Anonyma led him away. Please don't make peace for a week or two yet begged Q. Let me see what I can do first. I am going tomorrow. How foolish of you, said Mrs. Russell. If you like, I believe I have enough influence to get you to America instead. I think I like France best, said Q. 
I don't feel as if I could be content anywhere short of France just now. Surely you won't be content anywhere murdering your fellow men, said Mrs. Russell. You won't mind my incurable flippancy, will you? I can't help treating things lightly. Not at all, replied Q, but I am often content in the intervals of murdering my fellow men. I play the penny whistle in my dugout. Now tell me, said Mrs. Russell, what are you all doing here? What mischief are you leading my Herbert into? When Q had recovered from a foolish astonishment at hearing that Mr. Russell was known to others as Herbert, he said, We're looking, not very seriously, for my sister, who seems to have eloped by herself to the West Coast without leaving us her address. I know. Herbert told me that much. A place on the seafront, isn't it? But, you know, I feel a certain responsibility for Herbert. I have neglected him so long. I cannot bear that he should waste his time in what I call these stirring days. You mustn't think, because I treat life as one huge joke, that I can never be serious. One can wear a gay mask, but you understand me, don't you? You are one of us. There was a pause, and then she said, Ha ha! Doesn't it seem funny? We've only known each other an hour, and here we are, intimate. Q obediently allowed himself for a moment to see the humor aside, and then said, What are your plans, then, yours and Mr. Russell's? I have neglected him too long, poor old thing, said Mrs. Russell. I must stay with him now and cheer him up. A cheery heart can bridge any gulf, don't you think? You know, I was just what I call a jolly girl when I married him, and afterwards I forgot to grow up, I think. Perhaps my treatment of him has been rather irresponsible. I must try and make up what I call kiss and be friends like two jolly little kitties. Then why not join the motor tour? I would rather take Herbert back to our little nest in London. There's no place like home, as I always say. From there we might work together for the great cause of peace, what I call my grail. She had crimped hair and a long nose, the tip of which moved when she spoke. You would never have given her credit for such influence as she claimed in the world's affairs. Only her Homeric laughter and a pair of lorgnettes reminded you of her greatness. When Q finally disentangled himself from the company of this jolly creature, it was very late. But the voice of Anonyma arrested him on his way to bed. Her face, with a corn-colored plate on each side of it, looked at him cautiously from a dark doorway. Q, said Anonyma, I won't stand it. We must be rescued. Nobody can remove her now without also removing Ross and Christina, said Q. The reconciliation has gone too far. Then Russ must be sacrificed, and even the car, said Anonyma firmly. Gustus and I can hire if we must. That woman must be removed, the jealous cat. Q began to see light. I'll rescue you then, he replied. I'll think of a way in my bath. End of Part 7